Some time ago, 23 years last month to be exact, a mother lay in her hospital bed being given a shopping list of problems which her newly born baby was facing. Now this baby had multiple heart problems which would require surgery in the near future. Neither of the lungs were working properly. One was collapsed, the other was full of fluid. His liver was swollen beyond the confines of his body, causing a misshaped protrusion on his right side. One of his kidneys was a fibrous mass. He had a clubbed foot. His whole body was so swollen with fluids, he looked like the baby Michelin man and would soon develop skin infections the way the skin was pressing against itself because of this inflation. His sinus passages were smaller than usual, as well as the ear canals. His tear ducts were blocked, which would result in constant eye conditions for many months to come. And his palate was very deep, very, very high, which would re result in various challenges, including, as the doctor said, the inability to suck or ever drink to a straw. He was born seven weeks early via em emergency Caesar due to challenges which were presenting in the pregnancy. And immediately upon birth, he was rushed into the neonatal ICU where he had to be intubated as he was completely purple and didn't pink out when he was given oxygen as babies normally do. Virtually every physical aspect of this tiny baby was compromised in some way, even down to the fingers and toes, which were not typical. Many birthing mothers' worst case scenario, which most mothers would push out of their mind as being an impossibility, but still there as a dark cloud, but they would push it out. And yet, here this mother is, sitting before you 23 years later. And over the next few days, much prayer and faith would be exercised. And these two parents fought tooth and nail for the survival of their little boy against all odds. And many church friends joined in the battle and prayed with faith, which superseded the doom and gloom of the circumstances. And I can remember going in to see Sharon the one day shortly after the birth, possibly the following day, or maybe the one after that. I'm not 100% clear. It's 23 years ago. And God had given me a scripture. And I can't remember for the life of me how he gave me the scripture. I would love to be able to share how, but God gave me the scripture. And this scripture was from Habakkuk, or Habakkuk 3, 17 to 18, which says, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, Though the flocks may be cut off from the fold and there be no herds in the stall, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. And excitedly I went in and I shared this scripture with my dear wife who was lying there in the hospital bed and she was amazed because that morning the cleaning lady who was cleaning the floor had shared that scripture with her. And we took it as confirmation from the Lord. And we knew that the Almighty God was with us as we began this journey of fighting in the spirit realm. In what appeared in the physical realm to be an impossible situation. We would go in and we would see the doctor. Well, I would go in. She was there obviously all the time. We would see the doctor and he would give us a list of new things that they had found for the day. They kept finding new things every day. And we would go away and we would pray. And we would see one miracle after another. So I can clearly remember the one day going in and the doctor saying, your baby, the one kidney is a fibrous mass. I can remember, clearly remember that doctor saying those words. His kidney is a fibrous mass. 
And those words hit me like a wrecking ball coming in at full tilt, whacking me off my feet. Lord, what more are you going to allow in this situation, I thought. And we went away and we prayed. And we'd go in the next day and the doctor would be absolutely bewildered as this kidney was now fully functional. The only, exo- the only explanation the doctor had was there must have been a fibrous mass over the kidney as they were scanning. Yeah, right. Because he wouldn't accept that a miracle had taken place. I wonder if that doctor ever questioned in his heart what happened to that fibrous mass. Where did he go? Now, I wasn't able to pick up baby until he was five weeks old. But I would go in every day and stand next to that incubator and I would sing God's praises over him for as long as they would allow me to stand there. And this baby from the beginning of his life knew the praises of God in a terrible situation. I don't think I've ever seen as many medical devices connected to one human being as to what this baby had. But I praise God that he was connected to this baby. This baby was made in the image of God. This baby was fighting for every breath that he was taking. This baby who was receiving blood transfusions, which we were praying over as if it was the emblems of communion going into our baby's body. We were actually saying communion over it. And day by day, he surprised the doctors to be alive. The neonatal ICU sisters would phone in before going to shift to find out if he was still alive because they expected him to die every night. And they, they didn't know how they were going to face this situation because they had grown so in love with this little baby. He had crept deep into their hearts too. But a child of God with every physical challenge against him. But having the God of creation for him. And greater is he who is for us than he who is against us. Greater is he who is within us than he who is against us. What shall we say then to all these things? Romans 8.31 tells us. If God is for us, who can be successfully against us? Our job as parents was to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and to rejoice. To rejoice because God is on the throne. God is in charge of the situation. Does that guarantee that baby was going to survive? No, it doesn't. There are babies who do not survive. But guess what? Those babies are straight to heaven, straight in the presence of the Lord, not having to worry about all the things of this world and everything that's going on. That is is such a delight for me. As sad as what a, a miscarriage or a loss of a baby is, that baby is safe in the arms of Jesus. But here we were parents fighting for the life of our child and we were not gonna let go. My wife is like a pit bull when it comes to grabbing onto them, like a bull terrier. She would not let go. We had to leave the impossible, which needed doing to the God of the impossible. Did we have the faith to do that? He was calling us to take our eyes off the fig tree, which may be not blossoming. There being no fruit on the vines in this situation. Though the olive crop may have failed and the fields are yielding no food. Though the flock may be cut off from the fold and though there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. I've titled this message, as you probably saw in the beginning, Rejoicing in the Pit. And I can imagine Joseph as his family threw him into the pit. Has your family ever thrown you under the bus? Joseph's brothers threw him in the pit. 
sold him to traders as a slave. And there he got carted off to a foreign land. But God was with him. Hallelujah. Sometimes things look so bleak, they look impossible. God, why have you forsaken me? Joseph could have said. God had not forsaken his Joseph. God had a purpose and a plan. That is why we need to rejoice even if we're thrown into the pit. Even if everyone has turned against us. We need to be looking up. For my God is with me. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The question is, do we rejoice in the Lord? Do we joy in the God of our salvation? Or are we looking at the physical realm? Are we always looking at that which our physical eyes can see? This temporal stuff which is fading away. We need to start opening up our spiritual eyes. And seeing that which is unseen. For that is permanent. It is eternal. It is everlasting. Do we spend our time stressing about the fig tree which is not blossoming? Worrying about there being no fruit on the vine. Crying over the olive crop that has failed. Complaining about the fields yielding no food. Or are we rejoicing in the Lord the way we are told to rejoice? Rejoicing in the Lord does something in the spirit realm. It activates heavenly hosts. It activates that which is about us. You might never see it. I have never seen an angel. We have people in the church that have seen angels. I have never seen an angel apart from my angel. But I know about us in this place, there are heavenly hosts. When we were worshiping, they were with us worshiping. I couldn't see them, but I know they are there. I know that every day as I go about, maybe into a dangerous situation, maybe into a tough situation, I am not going in alone. I am rejoicing in the Lord. And as I rejoice, I set the atmosphere around me. The same as if I am down in the dumps and I am moping and spending my time weeping. I am setting a different atmosphere around me. We need to lift up our eyes. We need to rejoice in the Lord, the God. Of our salvation. The way I look at this. Is that we're given a choice. As in all things. We are given a choice. What is our choice? Rejoice and joy. Or worry. And stress. They are on opposite. Ends of the spectrum. Easy to worry and stress. In this fleshly body. It goes there without a question. Every one of us can get there. Every one of us has probably been there. It happens naturally. But for the things of God, the things that God tells us to do, we have to purposely do them. We have to specifically say, I am not going down this road. I am taking the high road where my God dwells. I am going up and it's hard. It's hard to go up when your flesh is heavy and being dragged down. It's hard to go up when the masses are all going in a different direction. It's hard to go up when your family is throwing you under a bus like they did to, to Joseph. It's hard. But did God say it would ever be easy? Did he say, follow me and ev everything will be easy and just work out? No, he did not say that. He says, in this life you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Are we rejoicing in the overcoming God? Or are we giving the enemy the glory with all of his destruction he's causing? And we're giving that all of our focus. Because at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. Either we are giving God the glory for who he is and what he is doing. Or we are giving the enemy the glory through our attitude and the way we function. God is wanting to do something amazing in your life, as well as in the life of this little baby that I spoke about. But do we trust him enough to let him do that? 
Or are we going to short circuit the plans of God and end up with nothing? Because that is the way of the flesh and it comes so easy. It was the, the Israelites' lack of faith which stopped them from entering the promised land the first time. You remember? It wasn't their, their lack of numbers. It wasn't their lack of strength. It wasn't their limited height in comparison to the giant. It was none of that. It was just their lack of faith which prevented them from entering in that which was promised to them. In Exodus 6, we read of Moses. He's trying to stir up the faith of the Israelites who were in Egyptian captivity. He wanted them to follow him and lead them out. But due to the severely harsh treatment that they had endured for all of this time, they didn't have the faith to follow him. Read it, Exodus 6. They wanted to be free, but they didn't have the faith. It had been beaten out of them so much. When we take our eyes off of Jesus and we start focusing on the things of the world, we are going down. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. That is the road to victory. Take your eyes off the things of this world. The enemy loves to hold you in captivity. He wants you to believe that things will never change. For you, it won't work. It works for someone else, but not for you. That's the words of the enemy, the lies of the enemy. Because your God is with you as much as he is with me. He has no favorites. The question is, not what is Satan's portion for you. His portion is death and destruction. The question is, what is God's portion for you? Are you going to press on, rejoicing in him while you're still in the pit? If you want to get out of the pit, look up and rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord and allow him to pick you up. If it's not God's portion what you're going through, then you need to reject it. You need to move towards that which God has for you. But what are you going to do in the meantime? In the meantime, you're going to rejoice even when you're not seeing the victory. I know it's a hard thing I'm saying. But do you want God's way or do you want the enemy's way? The enemy's way is that of the flesh. And the flesh is to complain and tell everybody how terrible the situation is and it will never change. If you're going to be professing Satan's plans and purposes over your life, then that will be your portion. But we are those who look to our God and we speak what our God says in his word over our lives. We are not limited to that of the enemy. Of course, Joseph got thrown in the pit. You could say, well, couldn't God have stopped that? Maybe he could. But the train that was going to Egypt was full already. God had to find another way. God wanted Joseph in Egypt. But he wanted a humbled Joseph in Egypt. Joseph had to walk a bit of a journey before he was ready to be exalted to the position that God had for him. Because if you read about Joseph with his multicolor jacket, he, he was... He thought quite a lot of himself. He was one of his father's favorites. God had to humble him in order to exalt him. By taking our eyes off of the problem and putting them on the solution, we start to change things in the spirit realm. We rejoice in the God of our salvation. Whatever your problem is, the solution is Jesus. Whatever it is. When you fix your eyes upon Jesus, you empower him to start taking the control. Picture this. You're in an airplane, smallish airplane. You are sitting in the pilot seat. The pilot is behind you. I don't know how you got him out of there. Just picture it. It's like a dream. In a dream, anything can happen. 
and it is so real, and you feel all the same emotions as if it was actually happening. Dreams are incredible. Well, you are in the, in the pilot seat of this little plane, and this little plane is going down. And the pilot is saying, come on, give me the controls. And you say, I can't, I can't let go, we're going to crash. Well, you're going to crash anyway the way you're going. And that's God with us. And he's saying, give me the controls. I want to help you. I can't let go. I'm going to crash. Yes, you're going to crash. Let go and let God. And start rejoicing in your God as he takes the controls, as he brings you out of that death dive and starts flying your plane for you. Demanding to be in control is going to ensure you have a crash. It's just a matter of time. If you demand to be in control, you're going to crash at some stage. Handing the controls over to the one who knows how to fly that plane gives you a chance to pull the plane out of its collision course with the ground and to get to where it needs to be. When you start trusting God, you will hand him the controls to your life out of trust. You won't be with white knuckles hanging onto it, knowing that you're going down but refusing to let go. Because you'll be trusting your God. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he shall direct your path. Rejoicing, not because everything is going your way, not because everything looks good and is smooth, but rejoicing in the fact that God has this. Whatever this is, God has this. The Apostle Paul in Philippians 4 tells us, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. What a beautiful promise. When you let go of all of that stuff and you refuse to be anxious and worrying, the peace of God which surpasses understanding, you cannot understand it because the situation hasn't changed. Everyone will tell you you're crazy, but you're, you know your God is with you and your God is going before you, making a way. The choice To rejoice is given to you. What is your response to God's call to rejoice? We are all in the flesh able to worry and to stress and to be anxious and to tell everyone about how bad it's going. Sometimes a person can enjoy things going bad because it gives them something to talk about. How dangerous is that? Spreading the glory of the enemy and the victory of the enemy in your life instead of declaring that which God is, is doing. We need to be rejoicing in our God no matter the situation. Let's say Joseph was left in that pit and he died. He would have left a legacy of rejoicing God, rejoicing of God in the pit. He would have gone down in history as the man who rejoices. But God had a purpose in his plan. And God didn't let Joseph die in the pit. He got sold into slavery. You think, oh, I'd rather die in the pit. Yes, but God had a plan. Rejoice. If you were Joseph in the pit, if you were Joseph being led to Egypt, if you were Joseph being thrown in jail, you would not have seen God's hand of blessing, as it were. You would have seen a traumatic situation. But our Joseph didn't give up. He rejoiced in the God of his salvation. Now, I wrote a little poem. It's a bit of a short one. I want to share it with you. You're the first people other than me to ever hear this. Not even my wife has heard this poem because I wrote it yesterday. 
The choice to rejoice is given as a command, given for our benefit, not as a demand. He knows what is good and that which is not, to help us move forward and not to get stuck. Rejoicing stirs the spirit realm and his heavenly hosts to action about us, directed by the Holy Ghost. The impossible becoming possible as God takes the reins, forgiving our trespasses and healing our pain. So today let us choose the choice of our Lord to walk in unity and be of one accord. To choose to be kind and gently with others deal and rejoice in the Lord no matter how we may feel. That's your poem for today. And as I was putting this message together, the Lord is saying to me, this is the crux of Christianity. It's not expecting and demanding everything to go your way, the way you want it to be, the way you see it to be, the way you had planned it to be. It is coming into the presence of God and saying, Lord, what are your plans for me? I rejoice in you, whoever you are, whatever you have, I mean, whatever you have for me, I rejoice in you. Let me just know your plan so I can walk in them. Let's not be putting on God that which we want. Let us be receiving from him that which he wants for us. And that is what prayer is. Prayer is not giving God necessarily a shopping list of things he must do. Prayer is coming into his presence and letting him change your heart so that your heart is in alignment with that which he wants. So let us humble ourselves before the almighty God. And let's start connecting with him in a way which brings glory to him. Rejoicing in him no matter what the circumstances, no matter what the situation. Let us rejoice and let him be the one who pulls us out of the pit, who takes us to a new place if that's what's needed, and who exalts us in his glory. Heavenly Father, we receive your word, Lord, and we ask. Holy Spirit, that you would weave it within us because it's not always easy to do this. It's not always easy to rejoice in you when things are going tough. But would you give us a new heart? Would you give us new eyes and new understanding that we can be the rejoicers of our God no matter what is happening about us? We rejoice in you for you are worthy, Lord, of all glory and honor and power and praise. You are worthy, God. And we just want to say thank you. We want to rejoice in you. We want to bless you. We want to walk with you. We want your purposes and plans for our lives, not ours. We don't put our our plans on you. We seek your plans for us. So as we go out from this place, Lord, I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would go with each person, that you would encourage them, no matter what is happening, to start rejoicing. And may they see mighty breakthroughs. As we saw with our little baby, that impossible situation he turned it about. And here he is in church with us, leg dancing and doing athletics and doing gymnastic competitions. When the doctors didn't even think he could see the light. You are our God, the God of heaven. We love you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace.